right, guys. So today we're going to talk about IPv6 and also multi podcast. So that's the reason there's two lectures. Wednesday we're going to have another lecture mainly on IPv4 and multicast. Today we're going to talk mainly about MAC addresses, uh, IPv6, and multicast because multicast is central in IPv6. So I, I don't have any other choice. So, and we will see that multicast actually impact all the layers, all the layers of the architecture that we have. We find multicast everywhere. Link layer, uh, IP for sure, layer. Uh, transport is mainly UDP, but we can use also other protocols that I won't, time, won't have the time to uh, study with you guys. And mainly we have multi-receivers applications. So let's try to understand what we mean by multicast and what is an in, in interesting uh, model of communication that is quite unique, actually. So um, the lecture today, so Ethernet, as I said, so we will see that there are multiple types of Ethernet MAC addresses. MAC and Ethernet is the same, right? Even though um, Ethernet is a subgroup of MAC addresses. Um, so we're going to look at the, uh, specifically at what we call the group MAC addresses, which is a multicast. IPv4, this time uh, quick, then IPv6, a lot. And next lecture going to be starting from here. So that's going to be on Wednesday. All right, guys. So let's start. So what do we mean by a multicast model? And to best understand this is we need to uh, compare this to the classical CS, client server application that we have. So mainly when you have a client, and that's the one we're using, what do you do? If you want to fetch a content, or if you need a service, you first need to contact the server. To contact the server, you provide the name, you do some DNS to get the IP. Once you have the IP, you do a TCP connection. And when you have the TCP connection, you finally send a request. The request either gonna succeed because the content is available, but if the server cannot satisfy your, your request, fail, and you need to try again later. That's the way it works. So you need to pull the content. And the content should be available there on the server whenever you want it. So you have a synchronous transaction here. Request, reply. That's it. If you cannot reply, it's failed. So now we have a second model, which is pretty, um, how to say, um, popular, which is a publish, subscribe, pub sub. Okay? And what is a pub sub? The pub sub means that the thing that you're going to do, the sub is you're going to subscribe. So you're going to subscribe to some kind of service, which is a content delivery service, all right? So which means here that actually when you ask for the content, the content doesn't have to be there. So all you say to the server is you say, well, I'm interested in this content. So whenever it is available, you just push it. Could be next day, could be in one week, could be one month later. Just the same way when you have a subscription for a magazine and every Monday you will receive the new issue or a monthly Every first of the week of the month, you're going to get an issue. So here it's pretty similar. So in order to be able to receive this in the future, you can understand that when you have a server, you cannot maintain the list of all the IPs of the subscribers and send one copy to each of them. This is almost impossible, right? Because you want it to be scalable. So that's the way, that's the reason here. What do we have? We introduce a specific type of multicast address. And spoiler alert, this is the class D. So we already talked about A, B, C classes, but now we have a fourth one, which is a class D. And this IP is not unique. It will be shared by as many subscribers interested in the same content. So it means that once the server has the content available, he's going to send one packet, and this packet will be duplicated in the network in as many copies as the number of subscribers, and everybody's going to receive that packet. Okay, so that's quite new. Um, so once again, the content delivery here is not synchronous. So it means that it doesn't mean that when I subscribe, the content should be available. No, it's the server. Whenever it's going to be available, going to send it in the future. So the server also doesn't know anything about the subscribers because all of them, okay, are hidden behind a single IP address, which is the class D address. So this is a complete, completely new model. And that's pretty interesting. So how does it work? So just for you to understand, because I know that, let's go concretely. So let's, let's say that at the application layer, which is the layer seven here, 
you use an application which is by nature a multi-receiver application. And the example that I took here is basically a live IPTV or radio broadcasting on the internet, okay? Live IPTV or live IP radio, all right? So let's say in your application, when you install it, you have like a list of channels, all right? So here is my list of channels. And so it means that everybody who wants to receive the same uh, program will basically need to install the same application. Those applications run on top of UDP. Most of the time, it's UDP. Why? Because we have multiple receivers. If you need to have one TCP connection per receivers, pff, not scalable. So TCP not good, let's use UDP, right? And so what is happening here is depending on the channel that you're gonna use, each channel, as you may see here, is basically matched to a class D IP address. So if you look at the first byte here, you can see that basically this is not an A, B, C, this is a D. We're gonna go into the details later. But once you subscribe one of those channels, what does it mean? It means that as a client, I'm going to configure my interface on top of all the IP addresses that I already have, unicast, loopback, and so on. I'm going to have an additional IP address, which is a class D. Okay? And because I'm listening now to this traffic, whenever on the network there's traffic for that multicast address, I will be part of the receivers. So it means that all I do is I listen on the network and, oh, oh, there's a packet here for that multicast group that I joined, that I subscribe to. So I'm going to receive the packets. And so what is interesting as well is that subscription, which actually make you subscribe to that specific IP address, will be translated as well as a MAC address, a specific MAC address that you will listen as well. Because as we said, all you can do is basically you listen to what the frames on the network. So if that frame is sent to a specific MAC address, which actually match the IP address, which match the channel that you subscribe to, you will be able to listen to that traffic. All right? So this is the three stages. So application level, you, uh, you cross a box, right? Then you add a new IP. Then you add a new MAC address. And normally, you should be able to receive the traffic. So that's the way it works. So let's get into the details of Ethernet MAC addresses first, okay? And specifically, the multicast MAC addresses. So MAC addresses in general, so this is a hardware number, okay, which is hard-coded. As you know, when you buy your computer, you already have a network interface, which can be Wi-Fi or Ethernet or even Bluetooth. And each of them have a unique ID which is an address, which we call a MAC address. So if you look on your phone, for instance, you have at least three interfaces, Wi-Fi, 4G, and Bluetooth. Each of them have their own MAC address. That's the way it is, all right? And if we look at it, so we already know that it is 48 bit long, which means that we have six bytes, okay? And it's divided in two. We have the first prefix, but be careful, it doesn't have anything to do with the topology of a network. This is what we call the OUI, OUI, which actually identifies the manufacturer of the card. So if we have Apple, we're gonna share that first prefix, giving that Apple, for instance, have multiple prefixes. So it means that Apple can issue any card starting with that specific prefix, okay? Uh, and the thing that is interesting is when you look at this first byte here and you look at those two first bits, the right most bits, there's the first one, which is a green one here, which is the IG, which indicates if that MAC address is an individual address allocated to only one interface, or if it's a group address, which means that that MAC address could be shared by multiple interfaces on the network, okay? So that's an easy way to know if it's a group address, could be broadcast, could be multicast, whatever. And the second one here is the UL. So the U, in, the U if it's set to, you see it's a flag, right? So if U is zero, so I mean, if that bit is zero, it's a U. If it's set to one, that bit is a L. So the meaning, Will, will depend on if you, whether you swap or not the bit. So if it's a U, it means that the MAC address is guaranteed as unique globally. But let's say if it's a MAC address that you play around by yourself and you set it up because you can manually 
allocate to the interface a fake MAC address, fake like local. You can do it as long as, yeah, you should make sure that that bit is set to one, okay? This is a good practice. Nobody will check. Nobody will say, oh, bad boy. No, no, of course not. Nobody can check it from outside. But a good practice is to say that you want to handle your own MAC addresses, put a one. All right, so that, that's the way it works, okay? So as I said, so we have multiple type of MAC addresses. So we have the broadcast, or everybody remember about that one, all once, FFF, all the way, right? Only once. So basically what is happening, if you send this frame on the network, everybody will basically see the frame, but that's not the, the trick here. It means that the packet that I have inside the frame will be passed to the layer three automatically. Okay, so we have the broadcast, okay? So then we have the unicast, and the unicast is the MAC address that is allocated by the manufacturer, all right? So you can always check by doing your if config to see what is the MAC address of your interface. Very simple. And on top of this, so in the middle, between the broadcast and your unicast, so once you send a unicast frame, still, everybody on the network will see the frame you can still see the frame. But since you see that this is not your MAC address, what can you do if it's not your MAC address? You can discard the frame. So be careful. So it's not because I'm doing a broadcast or unicast, only me will be receiving the frame. No. Everybody else is going to receive it. But thanks to the frame, you can filter as early as a link layer any frame that you are not the destination. All right? When it's broadcast, everybody will receive it just like unicast, but the packet which is inside, encapsulated will go upper layer. Upper layer could be IP, could be ARP message, right? Depending on when you are encapsulating. So in, the, in between of the, those two models, we have what we, what we call the group. This is Ethernet stuff, but it means it's multicast. And you may see that we have special kind of prefixes here. And all of them will have the, uh, you remember the IG bit set to one, just to indicate that this is a group address. And what it means, it means that now you may have a group of people sharing the same MAC address. If they sit on the same network, if you send that train, everybody gonna receive, but only the members of those group will take the packet, pass it to the upper layer, right? So it means that you can still filter, but now the frame may be received and analyzed by a group of people as long as they share the same MAC address. That's the way it is. So we're gonna get into the details of why. So once again, group means the J is set to one, okay? The G bit is one. Um, so multicast for ethernet have been allocated for special purposes. So one of the first one is some specific link layer protocols I won't get into those details because mainly they are not so popular. But one of that is interesting is that one here, that MAC address have been defined for a special type of frame, which is sent to do some flow control. So it means that let's say if you are on the network and you are receiving too many frames, okay, what you can do is you can send back in the network to all the sources, telling them that take it easy. You have to slow down. Okay, so this is a kind of signalization that you may use. So that's one of the one of the purposes. So some specific link layer protocols, but we also have specific ones. You remember when I said when you check the channel, automatically you join a class D IP address, automatically a MAC address. So how do you do the mapping? Well, we have those specific IPv4 multicast address, which actually, as you may see, share here. I put the prefix. And as you may see, because of the seven here, it means that the length of that prefix is 25. And it, we have 23 bits left to have 48. The 23 last bits comes from the IPv4 multicast address. I'm gonna show you in the next slide an example. So this is for IPv4. We're gonna see that for IPv6, we do the same, but we use a new prefix, which is a 3333. And we copy basically how many bits should I copy? 32. All right. 
In that case, in IPv4, we have 23 bits missing. In the IPv6, we copy 32. So it's, it's a difference. OK. So let's take the example of multicast v4 with a class D. So the class D IP addresses that you need to configure on your interface, whether or not you need to join a multicast group, multicast group that is identified by this specific IP multicast address. So the class D is indicated by the first bits, and they are set to uh, 1, 1110 for the bits. And the 28 bits left is what's going to ID the group. OK? So that's the way it is. So here I give you the range. So something that is interesting with the multicast is, first of all, it is not a locator, because you see that this IP address can be shared by multiple hosts. So is it related to the, to the location of the host? Not at all. Cannot be, since the host can be anywhere in the internet. Uh, there are some of them have been uh, uh, reserved for special uses, and the ones that you should remember are those two, right? So it means that here I have a one or a two, oops, or a two, right, in bits. And this is whenever you send this one, anybody doing multicast on your network will receive the traffic, or if you uh, send it to two, it's only the multicast routers on the local network. So when you do IP uh, multicast, so what do we mean? We mean that any host that belongs to the same group should share the same class D IP address. So those are well specified, right? So if I use an IPTV uh, live stream application, each channel have a reserved multicast IP address that's been allocated to that application. No problem, all right? So, the members could be anywhere on the internet, but they still need to share the same multicast IP uh, group D address. The structure of the group is totally dynamic, so it means that you can join or leave anytime. So the structure doesn't have to be fixed, okay? It may vary. And basically, um, to join or to leave, it means that you need to configure or remove the IP address that identify that group whenever you want to join. So you add that IP address or you remove it. And whenever you add the IP address, automatically you will start listening to the corresponding MAC address that I show in the previous slide. Okay. Uh, the sender doesn't have to be a member. So it means that all you need to be a sender is to know what is that multicast IP address. And then you can start sending traffic to that group. Okay. And you don't have to be a receiver. So of course, the advantage is what is the fact that since you don't need to list all the members, it's scalable, all right? Because all I need to know as a sender is to know that multicast IP address, that's it. Uh, it means that anybody can access a content without, without knowing where is it coming from. So it means that I don't need to know the server. I subscribe and I wait. I don't need to pull or to contact someone to receive the content. So that's very cool, you see? I just sit down here and I wait for updates. So that could be good for newspapers, that could be good for Windows updates every Tuesday night, you know, when they release uh, the update, instead of me clicking and saying, yes, please download the update, they can push it, right, through multicast, which they don't use. We'll see the reason later. Uh, but that's the model, right? Uh, the other thing is, um, is, of course, they have a disadvantage because as a, as a source, I don't know who's listening, so joining group, you don't need any authorization to do that. So anybody could be able to join any multicast group. So it's really hard basically to have like a paying service, all right? And the other thing is how can, can you prevent any source from spamming the multicast group? That's also challenging, okay? So there are some kind of security privacy issues here. But once again, as you see, this is a trade-off because if you want to make it scalable, you cannot have the detail. So if you need the detail, it's not scalable. But knowing the detail, you can make it secure. So as usual, you see trade-offs. So once again, as I said, OK, so you have a channel. The channel is identified by a specific group IP address that you need to join. And once you join it, you have a specific MAC address that you join. So how do you do this mapping here that I have, this one? How to do it? That's what we're going to look at. So the mapping is very simple. So let's say at some point, 
you have your your application running on your computer. So basically, you check a box, and that will add that IP address here, which is a class D IP address. Okay. Automatically, what's going to happen? Okay. It means that you're going to join as well at the link layer a MAC address, which starts with the prefix that I just showed you before. Okay. And you can see that how many bits is the prefix long here? 25. And so it means that how many bits did I copy from the multicast address? Yep, that's right. And so basically, that is how I'm creating the MAC address that I need to listen on the local network to be able to receive traffic. Very simple. OK? So you have to understand that this is automated. All right? IP address, because you check one box in the application, automatically at the MAC layer, you start listening to that MAC address. OK? So obviously, as you may see, we have an issue here with that model. And what is the issue? I, can, I think that you all see it, is the fact that now, if I have, let's say, multiple IP addresses will be mapped to the same MAC address. How many of them? Because I'm not copying those five bits that I have here, okay? because I only copy 23, which means that out of the 28, I leave five bits, which means that if you look at those IPs that I listed here, which are 32, Okay, they will basically uh, let you join the same MAC address. So the issue here is why? Because normally I should have copy 28 to make like a one-to-one -one matching. So why they did this? Because basically, you know, those MAC addresses belongs to the I triple. I mean, yeah, they are the owners of those MAC addresses. So it means that whenever you need some MAC addresses for a special usage, you need to go to the IEEE and make a case and say, guys, I need you to give me some MAC addresses for a special use. And they're going to say, okay, I'm fine with this, or I'm not fine. So you see, so here, so we said that we copy 23. So it means that in total, I have two power 23 MAC addresses that are reserved for that usage. If instead of this, I have 220. You see that that's a huge number of MAC addresses that you block for a specific usage. So the IEEE, when we say that, oh, we need 28, they say, no, no way. There are too many. So instead of 28, what well, we said that, OK, fine, if 28 is too much, let me reduce the number of MAC addresses that I need for that special use. So that's the reason I end up with 23. All right. Even though I totally agree with you guys, to have a one-to-one -one mapping, it will require to copy not 23, but 28 bits from the IP address to the MAC address. Is that okay? All right, let me move on. So what it means, is it that bad? It doesn't matter that much. Let's say you are on the network and you have two hosts here. And each of them have joined a specific IP address. You may see that because you have here 10 and here 138, if you do the mapping, that's going to be mapped to the same MAC address. So which means that if I look at those two frames here, the first one is intended for one group. The second one is for another group. So who's going to receive these frames? All of them, right? That's right. But now let's look at what happened. It's like when I receive it, they're going to be passed to the upper layer. In all cases, IP will receive the packet which is inside. So at that layer, I will be able to discard the packet if I haven't subscribed. OK? So is it bad? No. Well, it is bad because I cannot filter at the link layer. So it means that I will need IP to do the job of filtering, which is bad because I need CPU and memory. And we know that, well, MAC addresses are intended to avoid IP from bothering IP anytime I receive a packet, which I'm not the destination. But you see, that in that specific case, that's what's going to happen. Is it bad? Ah, it's fine. I mean, you know, I still can do the job of filtering, even though it's IP doing the job, right? No big deal. All right. So what is happening? So let's say I'm a source. So here I have the source. So the source will need to send a packet to the multicast IP destination. So this is a destination address. So does it make any change for me? Not really. But the big change here is the following. 
So since the destination is uh, IP multicast, the MAC address, do I need ARP? Do I need ARP to tell what is the MAC address? Because usually I would do ARP, right? ARP. Do I need IP? No. I don't need, because you see, I know how to calculate the MAC address giving the IP address when it's a class D. So in the case of the multicast, no need for ARP. I can do a local resolution to find out what is the MAC address. So then I will send it to the first net uh, router. Then I need to have a kind of special forwarding, and we will see that next lecture, how to do the forwarding when the destination is a multicast IP address. And then when I get on the local network, well, what I need for this router is to know, is there any members on this network? If yes, send the traffic because there's a receiver. If there's no members, I shouldn't bother the network with this traffic because there's no members. To know if there's a member, there's a special protocol that I run here between the router and the local receivers, which I call IGN. Well, we'll see that next week as well. So this protocol runs between the local router and the network to know if there's a member. If there's no member, what happens? No need for the traffic. Okay, so I'm not gonna use bandwidth for no members. All right, so that's the three steps that we're doing. And as I said, that part, we will see it next week. And also this one, because I'm gonna jump now to IPv6. Okay, so let's look at IPv6. So first of all, what I will do is I will see a few of the changes between IPv4 and IPv6, the main changes, all right? Just for you to understand uh, how IPv6 work. So first of all, the main noticeable change that we have is in the addresses. The addresses now are 128 bit long. Why? Because we know that 32 bit was way too short for the size of the internet. So now we decided to have 128. So basically, we will see that there are different type of IPv6 addresses, and there are no classes. So we don't have classes, we have types. So that's a big difference, and I will show you in the next slide. So normally now the notation is not a decimal quoted, no decimal anymore, everything is hexed. And what do we do? As you may see, we have columns, so which means that how many groups do I have? So here, how many bits per group between the two columns? So I have four hex, four times four, because one hex is four bits. So I have 16. Yeah, that's good. So 16 bits, which means two bytes. Is that okay? And I, as you see, since I have 128, I need one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, eight. Okay, so that is a global stuff. So what you should know, hopefully, as you may see, that can be super long. What we have, we have the compression format, which means that when you have a long series of zeros, one only, you can remove them and replace it by a double colon here. The double colon means that, oh, there's a bunch of zeros that I squeezed because it's too long otherwise. The other good news is we use a slash for cider. You see, so the size, of the prefix is given by the slash eight, which means that here the prefix is one byte long. Okay, so now no more mask with 255 and so on, just a slash. So we still need a mask, but it's provided as a slash. All right, uh, what do we have else? I will show you the packet in the next, next slide, but the header now, so it's interesting. So it's 40 bytes long, but it's 40 because of the IPv6 address, which are much longer. So, but if you look in total, if you count the number of fields, we have half the number of fields. So it means that a lot of fields from IPv4 have disappeared. Why? Because you see, when you ask the router to check multiple fields, it slowed down the forwarding. So in IPv6, the idea was to say that, oh, there's a bunch of stuff I don't want the router to do anymore. So since the router now is not in charge of many things, and I'm gonna push them where? At the edge, because it's end-to-end, -end, you remember. So we push as many things as we can, even from IPv4, and we keep the basic stuff in the network. So that's the reason we divided by two the number of fields. That's crazy. The alignment, you remember in IPv4, the alignment was 32 bits. That's the reason the IHL, IHL equal five, 
means that this is, what is the size of the header? Five times four, 20 bytes. Well, in IPv6, we don't do 32, four, by, four bytes, we do 64. Why? Because the computers now have an architecture, a 64-bit architecture. Right? The option is interesting. I'm not part of the header anymore. If you need IPv6 options, you add them as extra headers. So now options is like a new header. So you may have IPv6 header with 40 bits. You may have TCP later, or you may have also in the middle, if you need to provide an option, it will be like a fake header, option one, and then you're gonna have TCP. So options will be added as headers, as many as you need. So the interesting, because you don't need to extend the header, you add a new header as if it was a new protocol, but it's not a protocol, it's just an IP option. So I think it's pretty smart what they did. And the length of the option is included in the option itself. So I don't need to carry it inside the main header. So that's interesting. So on top of this, ICMPv6 have been also updated. So we added new messages. And the one that we want to uh, talk about today is a neighbor discovery protocol. So for that reason, we have five new brand new messages that have been added. Okay, so we're going to talk about this later. So here it is. So this is a header that I have. So you may see I have my 40 bits, 40 bytes, sorry. And we may see that the first one is maybe the only one that is shared with IPv4. Why? Because when a router receives a packet, he can be on a dual stack. So he needs to know, is it a V4 or a V6? If it's V6, let me pass it to IPv6. So I put the version with the same size, the same location, just to be able to uh, do a triage, you know, to be able to uh, uh, match the, uh, the packet to the right product. So what do we have else? We have the traffic class. So the traffic class is something similar to the TOS, but we replace it. And now it means that the packet may be allocated to a class of traffic with a special service, all right? So it can be used for quality of service. We have the flow label, and the flow label is something related to MPLS. So we haven't talked about it this uh, for the bachelor course, so let's forget about it, right? What we have, interestingly, we have the size of the packet they hear. We don't give the total size. We only care about the size of the payload. Why? Because the size of IP now is fixed. So do I need to add the 40 bytes on top of the payload? No, we know that the header will add some sizes, right? So in this case, no total length, only the payload length. The next header is the old protocol. Why? Because you may remember now, the next header could be a protocol like, such as TCP, and we maintain the same values or option, because the option is a header. So that's the reason I cannot say that since a option is not a protocol, I cannot talk about the protocol field. And we talk about the next header, which can be IP option, or a real protocol such as TCP and UDP. So here you can find typically the value 611, right, in hex. So I, I should put 17, I'm sorry. So 17, you remember 17 is for UDP or TCP, so we maintain the same values. Look at that here. This is the old TTL, but now we don't talk about the time anymore because there's nothing related to the time, and we call it by the right name, which is the hop limit. You remember that we count the number of hops. This is how you reduce the lifetime of the packet. It's not anymore at the time. So it's exactly the same function as a TTL, but we give it the right name, finally, right? So that's exactly how the TTL is working. And as you may see, that's it, guys. That's over. So what did we lose all along the way? We lose the, head, the checksum. Why? Because we already said that in IPv4, no routers do the verification, it's only the sender and the receiver. So why should we keep the checksum at IP? And what is more, you remember that TCP and UDP, they already have the sort of header. So why should IP double check something that TCP will check? So no more checksum at the job of the end holes. The routers are not bothered with this anymore. So no more checksum. Yes, the IP addresses and uh, something else missing. Can anybody give me like something else missing here? Everything related to the fragmentation. So no more fragmentation. Why? Because in IPv6 now, 
we have a standardized protocol that can discover the MTU across the path. So since now I know what is the minimum value of the MTU, the bottleneck, I can use it to match the size. So is fragmentation acceptable? No. It's like as if I'm sending all my packets with a DF equal one, no fragments, okay? Anyway, so I try to make it easy. All right, so let's talk about the, IP ad the, the type of IP addresses, normal classes, types. So what do we have? We still have a unicast, and your unicast, remember, used to be the ABC. The multicast is the class D, and we add a new one. So this one is new, and this one, bye-bye, no more broadcast. So now when I do IPv6, I'm not allowed to do broadcast anymore. And you should be very worried because you remember how many protocols use broadcast? ARP, DHCP. So what it means that those protocols cannot run anymore? Well, broadcast have been replaced by multicast. Why? Because you remember broadcast is everybody, multicast is a subgroup. So multicast do less harm, okay? So let's go back to the unicast. So the unicast, there are three main type of unicast addresses. We have the global unique, so it's like public IP addresses, the one that the ISP gave me, right? No problem. Then we have the unique local. So the unique local is quite interesting. This is for networks. Instead of using the private IP addresses, you, locally for you, you, local usage, you have that unique local, which is just as a private. But what it means now, it means that you don't have to choose between a public and a private. No. IPv6 lets you have multiple of them. So whatever. You need to send a packet outside, use a public. You need to send a packet to, a lo to somebody at NYU, for instance, use a private. And the last one, the link local. Do you need to send a packet to your neighbor on the same network? Use a link local. So depending on the scope of the traffic, you're going to use the right IP address that goes for that specific traffic. So that's really nice, right? So they just said like, oh, you don't need to replace the public by the private because you need an app. No, the private is only used locally. That's it. So pretty interesting. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, but I put here, as you may see, the prefixes that ID those specific uh, IP addresses, okay? But I'm gonna come back to this. Then we have the multicast. The, the Anycast, I, I didn't talk much about the Anycast because it's been standardized, but we are still missing some protocols to be able to use them. But this is very interesting. So the Anycast, what does it mean? It means that still I'm sending a packet to a group that share the same Anycast address, but the network will guarantee that out of this subgroup of machines, only one, at least one, will receive the packet. So multicast is everybody in the subgroup. Anycast is one out of them. What do we need that? Do you have any example that may be used for this kind of any cast traffic? Like there's a group of machines, I'm sending one packet, I want at least one of them to receive it. For instance, when you have mirrors, when you have like, you remember the root of the DNS, how many roots for DNS? 13, yeah. So instead of you choosing the one that you wanna ask, right? If all those 13 share one any cast address, you send the packet and the network will make sure that at least one of them should receive it. We are out of trouble. So that's why we need any cast. But right now, a routing protocol that could be do that could do this, it's yet to be uh, standardized. Okay, so but that's the example. I think it's pretty cool uh, communication model. All right. Anyway, so as I said, so now as a host, I don't have only one IP or two, I have many. I have many unicast. I have the link local because I always need to talk with my neighbors. Okay. And this is already happening with Windows. You can see on Windows machine, for instance, when you fail into obtaining an IP address, you remember that Windows is going to give you like a default IP address, which is something like 169. In Windows, there are many, many services that should allow a machine to talk with the local server. So in order to do this, you know, what is happening is they give you this 
fake IP address just to be able to do a local communication on the link. So here we have this, the link local. And something new is the fact that it can be auto-configured. So you don't depend any, uh, uh, on no one, either the HTTP or the admin. You do it locally, automatically. Okay. Then we may have multicast, uni multiple unicast, which can be either global, if you are multi-home. So let's say sometime a host now in IPv6. Yeah, so you may have two ISPs at home and one IP from each of them. And at the same time, you may use two ISPs at the same time. So that's new with IPv6. So it's what we call the multi-homing. Or the unique local, as you may remember, is a private IP address. I, I'm locally, okay? I'm locally on the same network. So I can communicate with somebody else on the same site, okay? The same organization using the unique local. Plus the loopback, because this is like the 127 that we have in IPv4. So you may see a lot of unicast. What is new, and you have to be careful with this, is like for any of those unicast IP addresses, you will have a specific multicast address that you're going to join for each of them. And this is an automated multicast address that we call the solicited node address. Remember about this. And of course, you also have, because of the application that you're running, as many multicast addresses because of the application that let you subscribe to a specific service. But on top of those, which are application level or application driven, you have the solicited. And this one is like kind of new with IPv6. So let's talk a little bit about the, the format. So as you may see, so when you have the global, so let's start with the global. You see that the three first bit is 001. Okay, so that's the reason it could be two or three here because the following bit could be a zero or one. So that's the reason it always starts with two or three. Even though three now, it's already perished because that was for experimental usage in the past. Now, mainly we have two. So if you have an ISP, like in France, if you use free, free give you a free IPv6 IP address. It's always a 2000 something, okay? As you see, we have the global prefix. So this is your ISP. The subnet is locally, so we can still have subnets. And you can further subdivide them if you want, depending on what you want. And you have the interface ID, which is 64. And you see that the interface ID is what we used to have in IPv IPv4 as the host ID. When I mean IPv6 is standardized, it's always 64 bits. And this is your host ID. When you are on a, on a site organization, so instead of having the global prefix, you have a global ID. All right, which actually is not provided by the ISP, but this is something that you can use locally and you can randomly select. And all the machines on your network will have this, which is just kind of a private IP address. Okay. Then what we have, we have the uh, link local, which is something that you're going to use with the direct neighbors on the same link. Okay, so the interface ID is quite interesting because as you may see, the prefix is already given, okay? The prefix here is fixed. 64 bits already given by the link local. Um, this one is given by, uh, sorry, this one here is given by your ISP plus your admin. Okay, so as you may see, the question now is how can I tell what is my uh, interface ID, my host ID? So in order to do that, in IPv6, we have new ways. New ways. Um, as we used to have before, we have the manual way. This is when the admin give me my IP address. Could be through DHCP because the DHCP is about telling, giving you a unique host ID on the network. And now we have a couple of new ways. We have the random way, which means that 64 bits, I take a random value. You see 64 bits, it's quite long. So having a random, the likelihood of, of having an overlap with another machine on the same network is quite low. So we do that, and in combination, we use the DAD. DAD, which means a protocol which is for duplicated address detection. So we use this protocol to make sure that it's unique. So this is random. And another way, another way which has been duplicated, but I'm sorry, yeah, it was pretty interesting, but I need to know the reason for, was 
through your MAC address. Why? Because the guy said, okay, the MAC address is 48 bits. And the manufacturer guaranteed that this is unique. So if I know it's unique, why not use it to make it unique for my interface ID? So that's what we, uh, we have here. So this is my MAC address. And that way was to say that, okay, so this is 48 bits. So let me add this. This is standard. And on top of this, the bit, which is a UL, will be swapped. So if the value was 0, I swap it to 1. So that's the reason the last x number here goes from 0 to 2. And so that is my interface ID. So you see, so locally, without the, the help of anybody, I need a unique one. Using my MAC address, I can do it. But unfortunately, normally nowadays, in most networks, they say, please don't do it. Why we shouldn't do it? Because you see, we, you remember the MAC address is supposed to be a local scope. Nobody else should know my MAC address outside my network. But now, if you use your MAC address inside your IP address, it could be seen from outside. So it means that now you are adding more, uh, you, you are giving up some from privacy. So that's the reason people say, oh, back at bad address, bad, bad idea. Don't, uh, don't let people know about your MAC address if they are sitting outside the network. Okay. So then we have the multicast addresses. Anyway, so we have eight bits here. So that's the FFF. All right. Then we have a flag. And the flag mainly is in order to indicate if that IP address is temporary or permanent. So temporary, what does it mean? It means that if I have a video conference and I need a multicast address for everybody to join, what I should do here, I should basically receive an IP address with a T indicating that it's a temporary. Then we have the scope, and the scope is pretty interesting. That gives you more control on where the packet should go. So basically, you can filter the traffic. If the multicast address is supposed to be local, okay, don't let the packet go outside your organization. If it's supposed to be global, it's okay for routers to let the, the traffic go outside. So as you may see, since the multicast is going to duplicate the packets quite in huge numbers, you may want to prevent the traffic from going everywhere by using a specific MAC address, um, IP address. Thanks to the scope, the routers may block the traffic. All right. So in IPv6, as I said, so for any... IPv6 multicast address that you have, we do the same as IPv4. But in our case, what we're going to do, we're going to use that special prefix here for MAC addresses. And I'm going to copy the how many bits? 32. And I copy them from the IP address. So for any multicast IP address that I have, I'm going to start listening to a specific MAC multicast address, which is the one giving me the 3333. Okay? So it means that now, most of the time, instead of using the broadcast, as we used to do with ARP and IPv4, in IPv6, what we're going to do, instead of this, we're going to use multicast. So let's see a few uh, usage. And in order to do that, we need to talk a little bit more about the solicited node address. So as I explained, the solicited node address have a specific format. And here it is. So this is a compressed representation. And as you may see, the prefix of that specific multicast address is 104 bits. So it means that how many bits missing in order to complete, for to have a complete IPv6 address? Yeah, because then I'm going to have 128. All right. So where are they coming from? As I explained to you, whenever you have a unicast address, unicast, and this is the case of this one, this is a link local, whatever it works for any unicast address. Here, I took a link local. Automatically, what's going to happen? Automatically, I'm going to start listening to a specific multicast IPv6 address that is a solicited one. So let's look at this. How many bits did I copy here? Those are 24 bits. 16 plus 8 goes 24. This is what I copy. Okay? So that is my solicited node address. And on top of this, because it's a multicast, I'm going to start listening to the MAC address. And the MAC address, as we said, I need to copy how many? 32. Here they are. And that's it. OK? And I do this for any unicast address that I have. So why do I need the solicited node address? Why? Because I cannot do broadcast. So let's see how it works now. So 
as I said, okay, so here I do a, a show IPv6, whatever, if config. I have two unicast. This is my link local. This is my global unicast. So this is my IID, interface ID, interface ID. Automatically, I will start listening to a solicited address, which I'm being created because I copy the eight, the eight, one, the 24 last bits. So this is my solicited note address. And on top of this, 33, 30, oops, that's supposed to be a three. And then I copy FF. 47, 15, 30. Why? Because here I copy 32. And that's it. Okay, so I copy first 64 from the interface ID to have the solicited node address. And then from the solicited node address, the MAC address by copying 32. That's it. Okay, ICMPv6 have been replaced, have changed a little. Actually, we still have the messages that we used to have. Errors like time exceeded, packet too big, destination reachable, all those messages, messages are still available in ICMP. Or the echo request and echo reply, those are still in IPv6. But on top of this, we added those two protocols. And today, we're going to discuss about the node discovery protocol, which actually help us into doing IRP front. So let's look. So node discovery have five new messages, and those are the types of those messages. And as you may see, we have solicitations and advertisements. So what it means? It means that either you can send a solicitation and then somebody gonna reply with an advertisement, or you may have machines that send advertisements which are not solicited. So either you send an advertisement because you've been solicited, or maybe you need to send advertisements periodically in time, right? So how does it work? So here is the format of those two messages. So here I take the neighbor solicitation and neighbor ad uh, advertisement, giving that you have the same for the router solicitation and the router advertisement, okay? But let's focus on the neighbor solicitation. So when I send a neighbor solicitation, I'm gonna send it, as you may see here, so the type which was 01 for ICMP before, now the new value is 3A for ICMPv6. 3A, no more 01, 01 is for IPv4. And here I have my message, okay, which is actually the message for the solicitation. I still have the type, I still have the code, I still have the checksum, just like in IPv4. And here specifically, I'm gonna have some options inside the message. First one, I have the target IP address of the destination of the solicitation. And on top of this, I'm gonna indicate through another option here, which is option type one, the MAC address of who, of the source. So wait a minute. So I'm sending a message and I indicate in this message the IP of someone and in that very same message, I give my MAC address. What for? Look, when the target gonna answer, so the target is the target here, the target gonna answer with its IP address, plus an option with a type two option, and whose MAC address do I have here? The MAC address of the destination. So it looks like ARP, but now I don't do ARP with a special protocol, I use ICMP. And to do this, I use the type 135, 136. That's it. So you see how I replace a protocol which was ARP, and instead of this, I'm using ICMP. Now we have a couple of questions to answer. If I know the target, if I know the unicast, can the source know what is a solicited one? Yeah, I copy the 24 bits into the prefix. So it means that you see here, the destination is what? Is the solicited node address for this one. And that's it. So let's take a concrete example. 
here it is. So please don't look at the don't look at the values right away. Okay. I have this machine here. Let's say this is B. I have A, and A wants to send a packet to this guy. I need to know the MAC address of B, and I don't know the MAC address of B, right? And that's a big issue. So what is a MAC address? And I cannot use broadcast. But wait a minute, guys. A, do I know the IP address of B? Do I know the IP address of B? Yeah, hopefully. Otherwise, if I don't know the address. So if I know the IP address of B, what can I do with it? I can know what is a solicit and node address. I'm using the standard prefix. What is the prefix of the solicit? And here, I'm going to copy those. Can you give me the, can A know the MAC address corresponding to this one? Yes, I can. It should be 33. 33. How many bits should I copy? You reset. So 24. <whistles> FF. FE. 22. 22. And now let's look. So which one is this? Yes, it is. It is. Multicast MAC address. I send this frame in the network. Who's going to receive it? B. Because B is listening to that group, even though it's not the MAC address of B, but this is a solicited one. And B will recognize itself because of this. It's going to say, oh, somebody wants to know my MAC address. So let me answer. So here, I'm going to answer to A using B source. A is a destination. And you see that here, Whose MAC address is this? I don't know how to move this. Anyway, it's too late. And I'm giving my MAC address. And here, this is a MAC address of A. So this is exactly what you're doing with ARP. Okay? Easy way. Understood? Okay, guys. So if you have questions, please stay online with me. If no questions, I will see you this Wednesday. And this Wednesday, we're going to do the second part of the lecture, given that starting from today, you can take the homework on IPv6. It's a short one for Friday. Guys, thank you so much.